I think my camera had shut off anyway, which is great. It's nice to know that if you need your camera, it'll shut off in your time of need. All right, friends, here is exactly what I am going to do. Going to get into, uh, going to get into this, I guess, in some detail here. Christians at risk of extinction in the land where current Christians began. Now, what I was saying in reference to it being used to hold up marriages, let me explain that in some detail here. In the Bible, and it's one of the few books that make this abundantly clear, by the way, in the Bible, we are called to love our enemy. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Loving our enemies isn't by any stretch of the imagination something that comes with a feeling. Following me here, how many people are getting divorced or separated or not giving their significant other a chance to further their... How many times do we hear, oh, I'm getting divorced because I'm not happy anymore or because I don't feel like I'm in love? One of the things that made the West excel as it did, if you will, so quickly and come so far in such a short amount of time, one of the things that allowed that to happen, one of the cornerstones of it, is the fact that even those who weren't Christians, I'm not saying you had to be a Christian, but that, the, the wars of Christianity, the idea that there is more to the family and love than a particular feeling, that it is about a commitment, it is choosing to show that you love the person who you care about the most. And love can be described as unmerited favor. So if you were marry somebody, then they have the most favor in your life. Well, a lot of that, to make a long story short, has been eroded in the West. And we're talking about bringing in so many mag migrants into the country, into the West, particularly in Europe, as this applies there. So my question is, if we were to take more Christians in to the West, from the Middle East. That would solve a lot of the vetting problem. What do I mean by that? What I mean is we can't tell the terrorists, like I said, from anybody else. They, they don't have any kind of solid background that can be checked. However, if someone is a Coptic Christian and they have a history in their church then that does establish who they are, which is one of the problems that's being faced in this vetting disaster, is the fact that we can't tell what side the person coming into the country is. In other words, the, the, Merkel has allowed so many terrorists into the country who were posing as people in need and taking advantage of the situation that it has become now an entire backlash against everyone who needs any help. And I'm saying, and I think this can be backed up rather easily, um, I think it's very easy to tell that if the person coming has a history with their church, then that would be a way to separate whether or not they were just claiming to be in need, or if they were. I think that's important to understand. Second of all, that would prove that they have something in common with the West. Because again, not every single Islamist is a terrorist, not even most of them. But there is a very large number of them who simply won't be happy in the West. They think that they will because of how bad life is where they are. And that makes sense. But once they actually get here, they simply won't like it. It will go against everything they have to do to keep their religion pure. And for the, the majority of Islamists who aren't out trying to butcher someone, 
that's important to them, that, you know, that their religion can stay pure. And it's, it's not going to happen in the West. Therefore, Coptic Christians coming here, they would be able to adapt to it well. Why? Well, one of the things the Bible says is to be in the world, not of the world. There were orgies going on in the days of Rome. Christ didn't say to ban the orgy. Islam does, but Christ didn't say to ban the orgy. He said, don't participate in them. Now, again, that's arguable, I understand, but you know what I mean. He wasn't condemning rich people. That'd be a better way to put it. He wasn't condemning any of the sin that he saw around him in terms of the government should ban it, but that the person should be what they feel is holy. And of course, you know, the Bible, and that's where different denominations have broken off, and this is okay, and that's okay, and that's a different discussion. The overreaching point here, and I think this is going to be one of my better shows in a while, correct me if I'm wrong, Th these particular Arabs are would be, we could establish who they were, and we could know that they're going to be able to survive in the country. And they've already been in Islam, where they've already been living in the land of Islam, where most people are not Christians. Therefore, they're probably going to make it in the West, where an ever-growing number of people are not Christians. So I think I brought up some good points there, and I want to, I'm going to mute this, I want to go over here exactly what's in the hill. This was a very good article. Ah, I said mute. That means quiet. As Christians around the world celebrate the nativity of our Savior, this was near Christmas, we gather in churches to hear the story of a Middle East where the Holy Family, as religious minorities in the Empire of Rome, witnessed the birth of Christ far from his hometown. 2,000 years later, the Christian communities of the Middle East, descendants of the first Christians, preserve in their faith in Christ. Now, let me let, let, persevere in their faith of Christ. Now, let me point this out here. Again, it was Islamists who stole the land from Christians. And now Islamists are claiming that Israel stole their land, which isn't true at all. The land has always been Jewish land. And it wasn't the Christians who ever attempted to stop the spread of any other religion in this particular part of the country. Like it, the, the, the Christians here weren't part of the Crusades. They have been here since the very initiation of the Christian faith, long before Muhammad. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, recently wrote of the plight of Christians in the Middle East, stating, Many have left. Hundreds of thousands have been forced from their homes. He warned that across the region, Christian communities that were the foundation of the universal church now face the threat of imminent extinction. I am sorry to say the Archbishop is not overstating the dire nature of the plight faced by Christian communities throughout the region. And this is written by uh, uh, Taufuk Balkini. So again, this is someone who has a history in this area and is well aware of what they're talking about. This isn't my hair's in my eye. This isn't just hype. Lebanon, the last safe home to Christians in the Middle East, has generously welcomed a great number of Syrians fleeing their country's civil war. The nation of 4 million people is hosting an estimated 2 million refugees and displaced people, the highest per capita home of refugees in the world. And again, it's very hard to establish how many of these are legitimate refugees, so what I mentioned earlier would be one way to do that. In northern Iraq's former breadbasket, the Nineveh Plains, the ancient Christian and Yazidi communities are slowly returning and rebuilding their homes. So they are being brought back, as Trump said needed to happen. So that is good. Um, because you don't want Christianity to completely die out in the area where it's completely born, born in. So migration isn't the end game here. And even if it was... Um, something that many of them wanted. I'm sure there's a great deal of Coptic Christians and other Arab Christians that would like to keep that faith where it started. And again, it doesn't mean running Islam out. It's that Islam is always trying to run other religions out. And 
it's not to say that every Islamist wants to do that, but whenever Islamic communities take root in other communities, inevitably those sorts of people tend to rise to the top. The ones that want to get everybody else out. Another year is passing in which the United States has not recognized the American, the Armenian genocide, and Turkey continues to harass churches and unjustly imprison innocent people. Uh, Obama took in virtually no Christians from the Middle East, but was encouraging a lot of Muslims from the Middle East to come into the country. And again, we run into the vetting problems I've now mentioned twice. And I don't think Trump has done enough for this very same group of people. I just don't. In Iraq, the promise of Vice President Pence that help was on the way resulted in the U.S. Agency for International Development committing more than $300 million in aid to religious minorities. So at least something was done. Uh, USAID Administrator Mark Green went personally to the region to conduct a needs assessment and appointed Special Representative Max Primorak to directly oversee the implementation of U.S.-funded programs. Green deserves credit for managing the difficult deliverance of aid to a sectarian region. In other words, even landing there to bring aid was a problem. Another predicament was set when Trump administration sanctioned Turkey a NATO ally until it released American pastor Andrew Brunson. So Trump is moving in this direction. Um, he made history by signing the Iraq and Syria Genocide Relief Accountability Act, which was a bipartisan bit of legislation that helps minorities. But the point is, we needed to, first of all, suggest, not mandate, of course, suggest to our friends in Europe the idea that uh, rescuing Coptic Christians from terror might be a good first step before we start trying to figure out which Muslims aren't trying to kill other Muslims at the same time that a great many of them are trying to kill Christians, some of them even if they're not trying to kill other Muslims. You might want to play that again, but it's true. Friends, and that brings us to the dumb deed of the day. Let me remind you, friends, that this is listener-supported. Uh, the research, the time it takes to do the shows, everything, I haven't been doing them as much, and I have to confess why. This has been the single worst eight weeks of giving I've ever seen. I, I, I can definitely tell Christmas hit. So if you can, please donate to the show at the correct views of hotmail.com through PayPal. Because believe it or not, mailing out the dunce caps and all of that does cost money. And a research time costs money that I could be doing other things. So please definitely support the show if you can. All right. Uh, Dumdy of the day. Uh, it's, it, Nancy Pelosi's on a roll. And, of course, things only roll downhill. <laughs> she just won the Dunce Cap of the Month Award mere days ago. And now... Uh, Donald Trump has pulled the plug from her flight plans. And CNN is whining... Uh, that she's accusing Trump of giving away her travel plans. Oh, BS. What he did was, uh, when she said that he should not have the State of the Union due to the government shutdown and security concerns, he responded wisely by saying, all right, well, if there's security concerns, then I'll, you know, you're not using military planes to fly overseas for your little shindig that she was going to do. Well, uh, CNN, of course, the Clinton News Network, uh, beholden to all things Democrat and Socialist, said, uh, in the middle of the night, State Department's Diplomatic Security Service provided an updated threat assessment detailing that the president, announcing his sensitive travel, had significantly increased the danger to the delegation and to the troop security. In other words, by saying that she was going to go there, he somehow gave away where the troops were. That's not in the least bit true, because these things are public media events from the time that leaders plan them. But this is Nancy Pelosi getting a slap and finding out, as many outlets have said, that she's not the country's leader. She's not. And she's not ever going to be. And that, to quote Obama, losing elections has results. 
It has, it has outcome. It has fallout. You got Cardi B out there, one of the most panelless people to ever pick up a microphone. I'm telling you, she, she's just horrendous. You've got that idiot out there saying in some way that Donald Trump is wrong for trying to shut down the government to have a wall built. But Obama was right to have the government shut down to give everyone free health care. She's blind to the fact that Trump building the wall is going to prevent a great number of gang members and other dangerous people from coming into the country, which will greatly reduce the number of people who even need health care. But you wouldn't expect uh, Cardi B to figure that out, because if you've listened to her music, she's about as intelligent as a housefly. My apologies to houseflies. I'm going to, uh, before I sign off, I want to, uh, I definitely want to get to this. This this is just priceless. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, as best I can, articulate this. Do I, yes, I do have it on. I'm just going to let it play, as a matter of fact. I was going to read it, but I'm not. I'm going to let it play. I'm going to go to screen share for those of you on YouTube. And uh, hide. Hi, Def. I'll just do it this way. Not only, I'll just explain it. Not only did Mr. Trump manage to take Pelosi's flight plans away, but he got back to her in another way. Just hours after ordering her overseas excursion canceled, President Trump added insult to injury by having Pelosi's luggage loaded onto a military liaison cart and had it wheeled down the halls of Congress and humiliatingly parked outside of her office for her to collect. He had her luggage, and possibly the luggage of her staffers, delivered by military plane <laughs> to the front of her office. Love it. Absolutely love it. It's about time that somebody put Pelosi and the people that have been damaging our country for a very, very long time in their place. And without a doubt, friends, that is the correct use. Uh, please donate if you can, friends. It's greatly appreciated. Good night and God bless.